uh, session here is going to give us a little uh, overview of two remarkable organizations uh, working in the Blackfoot Valley. One is the big Blackfoot chapter of Trout Unlimited, and the other is Blackfoot Challenge. Uh, these are extraordinary groups that have got national attention for what they have accomplished. I'm uh, most familiar with the DBCTU uh, component. Uh, that has, it's a small chapter uh, in Travel Limited, in, in Travel Limited terms, it's one of the smallest. Uh, in terms of its accomplishment, it is number one in miles of uh, tributaries restored, miles of uh, trout spawning uh, waters reopened uh, to spawning trout, uh, bridges built, culverts fixed. I mean, the list of accomplishments is amazing. Uh, Blackfoot Challenge works hand in hand with them. I can go on for an hour talking about how cool these two groups are. But that's not my job. My job is to introduce to you the people who are much more intimately involved with them. Uh, Ryan Heidecker, who is the, I would call, I believe, still project manager for Trump. Is that the proper type? Uh, <laughs> and Sarah Schmidt from Blackwood Challenge. Uh, between the two of them, they are, uh, they're going to give you, are going to tell you some amazing stories here. Uh, amazing accomplishments that have gone to turn this river uh, into what it is today. So, Ryan and Sarah, it's, uh, it's your podium. Uh, Ryan is a vacuee from Sealy Lane. She's living, she's living in a camper for the last three weeks or so, so be easy on her. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Um, so I'm Ryan and this is Sarah. Let's see if I can get this thing. Um, is it okay if I do this? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're going to tag team this. It's going to be kind of informal, but I just wanted to thank. Um, the folks that put this festival together, you know, Jenny was great. She has been working with us for the for the past year and really trying to. Um, she did a great job of including us. We were supposed to have a tour this morning, but uh, that got canceled with the smoke and the, the fire danger. But um, you know, just really trying to highlight um, the restoration that has happened in the Black Hole and uh, all the partners that are working together. So we appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. Um, and uh, again, we're going to take team this. I'm going to, I don't think we have a clicker. Maybe we do. So to bring it right down to what we're talking about with this festival. So the movie, The River Runs Through It, how many of you know where it was filmed? <laughs> All right. So you know it wasn't filmed in the Black Book, right? Uh, so we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so and talk about uh, the reasons why we think if there was a sequel to A River Runs Through It, uh, the Blackfoot would be the perfect place to tell that story. Um, when, the, when the producers came back, came to the Blackfoot all those years ago and they saw that the water was running, it was, was muddy and the flows were low and it, it did not illustrate um, the vision that Norman so eloquently pinned in his novel. And so they moved it. Um, but again, we hope that you'll be convinced as we are that um, if we could have a do-over, the Blackfoot would definitely tell his story. So the story, the story is a Blackfoot chapter of Crowd of Limited and Blackfoot Challenge are really interwoven. So we'll be kind of talking a little bit about about both of these organizations interchangeably, and I think the reasons that they got started, and there are people in this room who know this story a lot more intimately than I do, but um, are very similar. I wanted to start briefly by just introducing us. I think most people in this room know where the Blackfoot River is, but we're often presenting to people who, who don't, because um, there are people that come from all over the, the Montana, the United States, the world, to learn about what BBCTU, which I'll call the, the, the Toronto Limited Chapter for short, and the Blackfoot Challenge um, uh, have done. And so, just 
to note that it's a, in the lower left hand corner you can see that 1.5 million acre uh, watershed landscape outlined in, with red. It crosses three separate counties. And then some of the major tributaries are, 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 not, are noted on the, on the map. The Blackfoot River is 132 miles long, starts at its headwaters at Rogers Pass, past Lincoln, on the Continental Divide, and then runs down to its confluence um, with the Clark Fork at Bonner. It um, also shows us it's a very forested, heavily forested landscape, about 80%. And it's also positioned at the southern end of this larger ecosystem, the crown of the continent ecosystem, or the northern continental divide ecosystem. Um, one of the most biologically intact ecosystems in the world, all of the species that historically um, were in this area are still there today. And it also emphasizes um, by showing us the, the Swan watershed, the Blackfoot watershed, and then the Rocky Mountain front, our neighbors, uh, the map in the back, actually shows kind of the interconnectivity of this, this mosaic of ownerships between private and public. And really the impetus for a lot of the Blackfoot Challenges work was getting those individuals to talk to one another. If, um, if we're gonna try to manage this area with a larger view, we need to be communicating across, across borders. So what this also means being part of this intact larger landscape is that the Blackfoot watershed is not home only to um, species like Homo sapiens, but it's also home to a variety of other species uh, threatened, endangered, and, and species of concern. And with the reintroduction of trumpeter swans in the lower right, um, they were last documented, the last known sighting of them before they were found on a private property up in Lincoln was um, in 1804, when uh, Meriwether Lewis was traveling back east through the Blackfoot River Valley, and noticed that he saw these trumpeter swans in his, in his notebook. Um, so through a, through a partnership with many different organizations, um, trumpeter swans have been nesting now in the Blackfoot since 2011. So the uh, impetus for, for our organizations, and Ryan will talk a little bit more about this one, but obviously a legacy of mining, um, uh, not unique to, to Montana, but um, really all over the West and minerals leaching into the river, unsustainable grazing practices, uh, a large portion of the Blackfoot watershed used to be owned by corporate timber companies. They own no land anymore, um, which is a process that we've been involved in, um, but unsustainable uh, timber harvesting, uh, weeds. The annual tuber hatch that occurs every mid midsummer around the of July. So increasing recreational pressures, which really have been um, part of our story since the 70s. This wasn't something, I think BBCTU incorporated in 1987, the Blackfoot Challenge in 1993, but this dealing with public-private partnerships in terms of recreation interests, the Missoulians or people from all over the world coming up to Blackfoot uh, with and having to balance the use of these resources with individuals who've been living here for generations is, is, a, is a story and a partnership that's been evolving since the 70s, which if anyone's going to dinner tonight with Land and Hank, you will hear all about. So recreation pressures, and also development pressures. Um, people who I work with at the Blackfoot Challenge talk about how they saw the Bitterroot Valley ch uh, changing, and this large intact uh, landscape being fragmented, and wanted to try to get ahead of that um, in the Blackfoot watershed. So in the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, people started to get together and talk about do they see these resource threats happening the same that others do? Um, is there something that we could do about it? And does it make sense to form some organizations that could help coordinate a response to those issues? So a lot of numerous community meetings were held. Uh, this is our chairman, Jim Stone, who's a rancher in Oviedo, um, Rolling Stone Ranch, uh, at a community meeting in Hillville. And that really spawned the beginning of the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, so BBC to you, and Ryan will talk more about this, but with the focus on the fisheries, the Blackfoot Challenge took it to a, a ridge top to ridge top approach. So looking at all the lands within the Blackfoot, uh, unrolling a map that was much more complicated than, or I mean much less complicated than the map of the land ownership is today, and said, wow, that's going to be a challenge to get all of those individuals talking together. When I talked to Land Lindbergh, he says it wasn't such a matter of, um, or it wasn't just 
a matter of getting public agencies and private landowners to begin talking to one another and working together. Private landowners weren't talking to one another, and public agencies weren't talking to one another, and even sometimes individuals within public agencies weren't talking to one another. So there was a lot of need for improvement for just communication if we wanted to take a more holistic approach to looking at, at the Black River watershed. So, um, so the mission of the Blackfoot Challenge is to coordinate efforts to conserve and enhance the natural resources and the rural way of life in the Blackfoot watershed for present and future generations. Um, and so this is really the bread and butter of what the Blackfoot Challenge is, this community-based approach, which is what it's come to be called now. I don't know if they had a name for it back in the 70s. Um, but it's increasing in popularity, and we often get asked, um, you know, we love the Blackfoot Challenge. You guys have had so much success. How, you know, we want to, we have to put together a plan, and we have one year to do it. How can we do what you guys are doing in the Blackfoot? <laughs> and um, there's, some, there's some guidelines that we follow, but the biggest piece is that this takes a lot of time because it rests on relationships and partnerships. And you can't rush. You can't rush trust, and you can't rush credibility. And that's what this is all built upon. So these are some of the guidelines that, um, that we really try to follow. So first is inviting participation by all stakers, stakeholders. Uh, it's an inclusive process. Everyone who has a stake in an issue is invited to the table, always. And that invitation is always open. Um, if people don't want to accept it, that's their, 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 their choice, and that happens. Um, but it's, it's a very inclusive process. So the door is always open, public-private partners. Every, um, Every public agency that manages land in the Blackfoot watershed has a seat on the board of the Blackfoot Challenge and always will. It's written into the bylaws. And then we lead with community values. So, um, and science supports the conversation. So this is an important nuance, I think. Um, to start the conversations off, you know, if, if, if um, as, as biologists, we're coming into the valley and recognize how amazingly intact this landscape is and the importance of conserving these species, that they weren't going to make that much headway if they began with their, with their issue. So we need to become a part of the community, hear what maybe those local issues are, are, are which are important first, choose to tackle those, get to know um, the people that you're working with, and then later, or and then incorporate science as, a, as it supports the conversation. Um, a rancher from Helmville, David Mannix, brought the 80-20 rule to the Blackfoot Challenge. And so this is essentially saying, let's start off the conversation by focusing on what we agree on. So what are our shared values? You know, I think it's human nature to begin the conversation with where we don't agree, right? And immediately launch into conflict. Let's try to put whatever we don't agree on on the back burner until we can agree on something um, let's focus on what we agree on first. So some of those early -ish conversations uh, in the Blackfoot, I know one of our first committees was weeds. Number one, public common enemy. Kind of easy to, to rally around that. That gives us an opportunity to get to know one another. And I, and I mean get to know one another on a more personal level. So not just professionally, um, but actually, you know, recognizing that our kids go to school together or that we have some, we have common interests. Or that, you know what, you screwed this up, but you, you owned it, and you came back and you apologized. And you, so it gives you an opportunity to kind of work on something, getting to know one another on a personal level first. Um, and then later, you can have that trust, trust, credibility to work on the 20%. That's a real, um, it's, it's simple, but it's maybe not easy. <clears throat> and then proper pacing. This is one that um, Greg Medecker, I think I first learned from Greg Medecker, um, you can't get ahead of your partners. Again, you know, again, all this stuff, it sounds so easy, right? But it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of tricky. Um, so if you're, if you're making a decision, somebody's not in the room, you can't effectively, you can't really make that decision. Because if they come to the table later and say, you know what, the decision that you made, it, it compromises my values. I, um, I'm not in support of that. Then you aren't gonna have a solution that really could last the long, the long term. So what we try to do is, is, is take it slow. And so that's why you can't put together a plan in one year. Um, you have to get to know the people that you're working with, and you might not know the people who are affected by an issue for years, or for a while. 
and, and including a coordinating framework, this is the Blackfoot Challenge. So once you get together, you decide what you should do. There are 14 staff, I think, now on the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, when I started, it was seven, so we've grown quite a bit. Uh, uh, but who's going to coordinate that, that work in the interim? And that's what our organization is doing. So we think that by following this process, you build that trust, the credibility, you build personal relationships with individuals, and that is how you can get to the blasting solutions on the ground. Um, so that's kind of a caring base. And then here, this is um, just emphasizing that, that this is about people. This is about knowing how to work with people. I've met some of the most amazing individuals through this work. Um, I've been here for six years now, and I. Um, we have board meetings once a month, and it is always just a real treat for me to watch the leaders in the Blackfoot Challenge interact <coughs> in that room and how they lead a conversation. And um, it really requires committing to listening to people that you don't agree with, really uh, hearing them out, and trying to understand where they're coming from. And it, re it requires leaving your ego at the door. I mean, these are some of the most humble people landlord especially, some of the most humble people that I've ever met. And I think that it's, it's because of individuals like that that this is so successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly go through um, just what are the committees that have evolved over the lifespan of the Blackfoot Challenge. Weeds, like I mentioned, uh, an easy earlier rallying point, um, an issue that was very important at the foundation of the Blackfoot Challenge, and still is today, there's still weeds, we're still working on this one. Um, our education committee, just a variety of programs to getting youth outside. Patty Bartlett is the chair of our education committee from the Sealy Lake Elementary. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel our swan release that was going to happen on Thursday because of the fires this year. Water, recognizing uh, the multiple stakeholders that have um, that need access to the water, uh, including irrigators, including fish. So coming up with a drought response plan. Um, a voluntary drought response plan for individuals to participate in uh, in years like this one. I think we hit our low flow trigger of 700 CFS on August 10th this year and are hovering above 500, but we just sent out a notice this morning um, that we are not going to activate. I mean, it's all voluntary, right? but we're not going to activate the drought plan this year just because of the uh, very serious situations happening in Blackfoot right now with the fires and people need to be able to exercise their water rights. Um, wildlife has really been a cornerstone for partnership building. Um, obviously being a part of such an intact landscape, these ranches have wolves, grizzly bears, lynx, um, not lynx, but um, at their doorstep. And so some of these, these critters are coming onto their ranches and, and it's been a um, joint fact finding, learning where those, those conflicts are occurring. Conflicts can range anywhere from a bear digging up tulips in your garden to um, to killing, to actually like killing a, a person. And so how can we, what are the strategies that we can utilize to reduce those conflicts? So stuff like just on the far left, just using radio telemetry on collared bears, knowing where they are in proximity to, to cattle that are out grazing in the summer on um, public allotments. This simple um, electric, just one line of electric fence with, with that, that's called flattery, waving in the wind, will actually scare, it actually scares wolves away. So putting that around calving areas, um, electric fences. We've installed, I think, over 18,000 feet of electric fences in the Blackfoot around calving areas, around beehives, which are common, um, conflict sites. And then we actually have also compost livestock um, in cooperation with the Department of Transportation. We've been doing that for a while. Uh, our Conservation Strategies Committee, like I mentioned, Plum Creek Timber Company no longer owns any land in the Blackfoot. Uh, we've been partnering with the nature, I realize I'm breezing through this because we don't have a lot of time, there's a lot of meat I could get into, but just that um, essentially as, as development, as real estate property is, values have increased over the years because of development pressures, Plum Creek Timber Company has been selling land. And we have partnered with the Nature Conservancy to follow what we call just a community driven disposition process for figuring out what the permanent ownership of those lands would be such that it protects natural resources and the rural way of life in the Blackfoot. And this is, or if you go back one time, this is just a map showing all of the, I think this includes conservation easements in the valley as well. Um, so all the protected lands in the Blackfoot, um, 
and the majority of that was, was previously Plum Creek Timber Company land. And then also just better education about conservation easements. I remember talking to Michael Seda and Demi, uh, one of the, the first executive director of the Blackfoot Challenge, and, and conservation easements was one tool that people were using at the beginning. You know, conservation wasn't necessarily the, the drive driving the conversation. Conversation was the outcome of this process. And I think that's, I, I enjoy hearing that perspective. It's about, it's about you know, our, our organization exists to really help the community understand what's going on, get the information they need, and then they make the choice. Conservation has been a choice over the last 20 years in the Blackfoot. And then our forestry program, which really kicked up in 2008 after the Jocko Lakes fire, um, a year that was uh, similar to this one, working with private landowners to decrease wildfire risk in the WUI or the wildland urban interface. Um, so very relevant in, in years like this one. So these are just a, a variety of our different committees. You know, um, they kind of come and go depending on what the needs of the community are and responding to the needs of the community. And across all this, this is a great quote that Ryan had by land, but how do we measure our success? Well, the Blackfoot River is really that barometer. Um, which brings us back to Ryan. I'm not as tall as Sarah, so I'm going to do this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Blackfoot Trout Unlimited chapter. And our focus is on our mission specifically is to restore and conserve the, the cold water fishery of the Blackfoot and its tributaries. And we are working with a whole host of public and private landowners. We have over 260 different private landowners we work with, but you know, the Forest Service, BNRC, BLM, the Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish Wildlife and Parks, Five Valleys Land Trust, you name it. We're trying to um, include everybody in this work and to kind of break down our mission a little bit more. Uh, when I'm talking about the cold water fishery, I'm talking specifically our native trout. So that would be our bull trout and our cutthroat. And these are, if you, they're kind of like the canary in the coal mine example. So their presence or their absence is an indicator to us of how well the habitat is functioning. Um, so these fish have higher habitat quality needs than say rainbow or brown trout. They require the four C's, so cold, clean, complex, meaning lots of wood in the streams, undercut banks, those types of things, pools, deep pools, and then um, connected. So we've actually documented fish moving 90 miles to get to where they need to spawn in the river, or out of the river into the tributaries, I should say. So they, they can't have dams blocking their way. They need to be able to move freely. So um, to talk more about, when I talk about the uh, restoring the Blackfoot River and its tributaries, when people think about restoration in the Blackfoot, a lot of times on tours, people are surprised when we take them to a little tributary that you can step across. You know, we have this, this beautiful river, this iconic Blue River Trout Stream, um, but the 1,900 miles of perennial tributaries that feed the river are where we're spending our time. These are the lifeblood to the river. This is where the spawning and recruitment is, is occurring. So, as Sarah mentioned, uh, the health of the river is directly related to the watershed, and, and the health of our tributaries is going to show up in the fishery in the Blackfoot River. Um, in Montana, we have a wild trout policy, which means we don't stock any trout in our rivers and streams, so everything is self-sustaining. So we need, we need, these are wild trout, they need really good habitat if they're going to make it. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore habitat, but we have this huge watershed, 1.5 million acres, 132 miles of river, 1,900 miles of stream, where would you start? And we have this advantage where for the last 28 years, Fish Wildlife and Parks, the Forest Service, and others have been out collecting data. So they're out looking at these streams and um, collecting fish and doing red counts, which tells you where fish are spawning. They're collecting water quality samples. They're doing habitat inventory work. So they've actually inventoried over 260 different streams. And they've taken all this data and um, we found that, you know, we are not immune to threats to trout in the Blackfoot. I mean, these are the usual suspects of, of habitat um, damage that affect trout. We have, we have issues that Sarah laid them out. And, um, but the neat thing is, is, instead of pointing the finger, we're trying to figure out how to work together to improve these and, and have a working landscape, but have 
um, these, these, these trout populations do really well. So we've taken all this data and we've actually developed a restoration action plan, which is, um, this is one of the first ones we did um, way back, but it's, it's our roadmap. It's telling us where we should focus our efforts, where we should spend our time to have the biggest bang for our buck. You know, we have limited time, we have limited resources, we need to really focus in on those areas where we can make a difference. Um, so we have, we have um, basically broken down this, the tributaries into high, moderate, and low categories. And again, it's just, it's telling us again where we're gonna be the most efficient with our time. Um, and the types of work that we do, um, <coughs> talk about uh, channel restoration first. So this is a spring curve that fed the North Fork of the Blackfoot River. So you look at this and you see an overwidened, shallow um, system that's not gonna be supporting trout. Uh, the temperatures are high, there's a lot of sediment. So we came in, uh, this was a project we did in uh, 2006, and we restored 18,000 feet of this spring creek. Um, we did this by bringing in sod mats and deepening pools and adding wood. Um, another example in the same area, um, this is on a different spring creek, kind of before and after again, just um, restoring Sometimes it's hard to, if you keep your eye on that tree, we go back maybe, keep your eye on the tree, the big pea pine there. Um, so just restoring these systems back to where they can function on their own. And the biggest, uh, I mean, we're, we're directly impacting the spring cricks, but then uh, we have restored 10 different spring cricks in the Blackfoot that feed the North Fork of the Blackfoot River. And we're decreasing these temperatures back down. These native trout, they want to be under 60 degrees water temperature. So we're getting back into those temperatures where these fish can do well. And when you add up uh, 10 CFS on this stream, 8 CFS cubic feet per second. So when you add up all this water, you have about 50 cubic feet per second of water that's now cold water that's now coming into the North Fork of the Blackfoot River. And the North Fork is one of our most important bull trout cutthroat streams. And so in a year like this, when we have a severe drought, extreme temperatures, these spring cricks are, are gonna be holding their own and they're gonna be contributing this cold water in the North Fork. Another example of some work we do, this is a bank on the Clearwater River. This is just north of Sealy. This is a project we worked with the Forest Service on three years ago. Um, this was gonna be one of our tour sites if things were different, but uh, the Clearwater River is an important bull trout stream. There's actually uh, Western pearl shell mussel still living in this little stream as well. Uh, but we have this eroding bank. You have all this sediment coming in, there's no vegetation. This is right above the canoe trail, so it's a really visible spot. So we came in, like I said, three years ago and brought in wood and willows and uh, basically brought back this, this riparian area. And now these banks are stable and you've eliminated the sediment source. Uh, other examples of work that we do, we, we've been starting to do a lot of uh, mine site restoration. So basically, uh, we're looking at placer mines, so rock that's been piled on the floodplain. This is a little stream up in Lincoln. Uh, it's called Stonewall Creek, and there was 4,000 feet of channel that was lined with this rock. We moved, um, what was it, 300,000 yards of material out last fall. So we get, so you keep your eye on this. On this mountain here, you get rid of all that rock. Your stream can then flood again. You have plants come in. Um, so this is a little cutthroat stream. So all this stuff, we're just trying to keep adding it to the list. And long term, it'll make a difference. We work with volunteers. We do a lot of revegetation. Most of our stream projects involve a, a reveg component. And uh, trying to get the school kids out, getting them involved, um, similar to the Challenge Education Program. Uh, we do a lot of work with private landowners. We're working with, we know a lot right now with the Forest Service, but uh, a large portion of uh, private land, there are, there are fish that are uh, spawning, rearing, overwintering, and our program is all about trying to find win-win solutions where you can, have, you can have grazing and you can have a healthy stream. So we work with landowners on Offsite water, this is a solar system that pumps to this tank. Um, grazing management systems that involve riparian fencing, those types of things. So just trying to kind of make everything work in this, in this rural landscape. 
uh, water conservation. Obviously, fish need water. Um, so we work on work with landowners on lining leaky ditches, converting from flood to sprinkler. Um, in Montana, we have a pretty neat tool where you can actually in-stream flows um, are considered a beneficial use. So a landowner who was maybe using all of his water rate to flood his meadow, we can help him get him into a more efficient system and maybe we can save half of his water and that can be protected with an in-stream flow lease. So I won't get into the, the details, but basically there's just, it's a tool to again have a win-win. You can have water in your stream and you can have water for irrigation. And we have conserved almost 50 CFS or 23,000 gallons per minute of water by doing these projects. Uh, going hand in hand with irrigation, a lot of times when uh, irrigators are pulling water from a stream or a river, um, they have an open ditch, meaning that there is not anything at the front of it to stop fish from going down. So we have installed, I think we have 39 different fish screens now. These are just some different examples. We have uh, drums, the, the two top pictures, um, hydropowered or electric drums. We have self-cleaning paddle wheels, a picture on the left, and then uh, this other, it's a turbulent fountain, which anyways, we have a bunch of different examples of fish screens, and these are designed to pull a landowner's water right but keep fish um, out of the ditch and in the river where they belong. This is just a map showing you where the fish screens are located in the Blackfoot. And I don't know if this video will work, just to kind of show you one is in action. Nope, it's not gonna work, that's all right. Maybe? Yeah, speak out of it. That's okay. That's um, okay. So um, fish passage, I mentioned connectivity. These fish need to be able to move great distances to where they need to, to spawn or where they need to overwinter. So we work with, um, with landowners on upgrading stream crossings. So you look at a culvert like this, um, it was undersized, and so basically in the spring when you have a lot of water coming through there, it's like a, a fire hose. And over time, it's shooting enough water out that the stream starts to cut below it. And then you have a barrier because it's too high of a, um, it's too high for the fish to jump from the stream up through the culvert. So this is actually a project we worked the Forest Service on and almost 10 years ago, but just came in um, with a new bridge, and so you uh, you get your fish passage back, and then you you eliminate that uh, that channel impairment, all that that pressure point on the on the on the stream there. We also do um, not everything gets replaced with the bridge. There's oftentimes the size of the stream lends itself to a culvert. So this is a we just took out this undersized culvert and went with uh, what, it's a bottomless arch. And you basically are trying to make the new structures you put in the stream invisible to the stream and to the fish and the tail frogs and everything else moving in these streams. We do um, road decommissioning work in those areas where the community for the most part is on board. It's definitely a tough issue. Um, the Forest Service have identified roads like this one. Um, on the left, there was a road that ran right up this little bull trout stream and you cross the stream five times. A lot of sediment coming in. They actually moved the road into the upland, so you, you still have your, your access for people, but you eliminate um, all this sediment from cars coming through. So this is the before and after. The stream is somewhere in here, um, but we just try to restore these systems so that the, the roads are gone and, and the sediment source is gone. Um, fish passage at irrigation diversions. Uh, this is a small dam that I, we were also going to look at our tour today. This was on Trail Creek. This is right by Double Arrow. We work with the Double Arrow Landowners Association and the owners of Double Arrow. And um, this was blocking access for bull trout and cutthroat 18 miles upstream. So um, on the left, you can see there's this green, it's, a, it's actually a fish ladder. Um, so that was the temporary solution, but Fish Life and Parks has shown that these fish avoid it. They don't, they don't like, they don't, they don't move through them. So this was basically a barrier. So we came in and this is what it looks like now. Just uh, took that out, built a little uh, river step pool through there. And 
there, it was part of a larger project where the irrigators can still get their water. There's a fish drain in the ditch. This ditch actually is what um, irrigates the Double Arrow Golf Course, for those of you that are familiar with it. So not everything's out on a ranch. There's also, with, uh, with Sealy and Clay, there's other op opportunities there as well. So this is a long-term investment. Um, this is BBCTU's 30th year. Um, there are several board members in the room today, past and present. Um, but um, with our partners, we've been able to invest about 15 million on the ground for uh, restoration. And that means jobs. We estimate about 220 jobs. Um, this is good for our economies. Um, next slide. And you know, we, we hire local contractors. We hire guys that live in Orlando and Sealy. Um, that are actually moving dirt for us. So we're buying our fish screens and our pipe from um, a supplier right in CB Lake. But just getting these local communities involved is what makes this program sustainable, I think. Um, and all of this work is translating to a cleaner river system and our, you know, our, our angler days, we estimate about you know, 40,000 angler days. So this is good for businesses like Trixie's, and the stray bullet and the B&Bs um, throughout the Blackwood. So to get back to, again, the tributaries being the health or their, the lifeblood to the river and how well our fisheries are doing in the Blackfoot River is gonna be directly correlated to how well our tributaries are doing. So this is, this is West Slope Cutthroat numbers in the middle, or I'm sorry, we're in, okay. <laughs> Okay, we're at bull trout. So we're talking about um, the number of spawning nests that we have seen in the three main bull trout streams, Copper, Monitor Creek, and the North Fork. So it started in, so they started doing red counts in 1989, and somehow it, the wrong slide's in here. But um, I'm evacuated, so you have to give me a break. Um, <laughs> um, so basically, we are up close to 300. So that's about an 800% increase in bull trout numbers. And that's in the face of some pretty severe drought years. And it's a similar story um, for cutthroat. And uh, so again, with these fish um, you know, being our best indicators, um, we feel happy with where things are going. We learned something not to do on every project, I can tell you that much. Um, but it's, it's really a partnership effort, and uh, we're hoping we can uh, we can keep this thing going for at least another 30 years. So Sarah and I are gonna be here for questions, but thank you for your time. Any questions? Yeah. How are the present um, fires affecting your, your work at the moment? So the question was, how are the fires affecting our work? Um, so in the Powell and Missoula County, we are on stage two restrictions, meaning um, we're basically shut down. We had projects that were supposed to be done and happening right now, and they are on hold. Um, so it's, it's definitely slowing things down, but big picture, we'll just have more to do next year. So. Yes. Follow up to that. What is the long term effect of the fires on the work that you've done? I mean, yeah. It's hitting the North Pole. Yeah. Um, what do you expect the long term effect to be? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be positive for now. <laughs> um, fires do have their they have a natural role in the ecosystem. Um, you know, that, that Canyon Creek fire that was in 1988 in the North Fork burned pretty hot and our, North, and our bull trout have been increasing since. Um, we've seen other examples like up in Copper Creek where you see a, a big nutrient influx in a positive way. Um, there's other areas that are gonna be, that are gonna burn pretty hot and there's gonna be some, some impacts. It's gonna be a tough year, but I'm optimistic that, you know, what we've been doing to increase connectivity so these fish can go elsewhere for the time being. Um, and we may have to get involved with some, I know the forest is going to do some heavy rehab on stuff, but I'm going to be optimistic and say we're going to, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. So 
That's a lot of work. What's your volunteer base? Um, we have a great group of volunteers. We rely on local schools. Um, but really, I would say, I, I, I can't emphasize it enough, when you have the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, you know, Fish, Wildlife Parks and all of these other biologists, we're all working together. Um, and then we have really qualified contractors that know what they're doing and um, that have really fair prices. So it's just a team effort. Um, volunteers play an important role like with revegetation, but the most of it is, um, it's, uh, again, it's just we have a really good group of, of contractors and consultants that know what they're doing. So. Are they largely from the region? Yes. Um, every consultant that does like our stream designs, our culvert upgrades, they are all in Montana. And of the six contractors that are on our list, half of them live in the Blackfoot, um, and the other three live either Missoula, Eureka, or Helena. So, yeah. So the question was, the, the creeks that we are restoring, are they wider and shallower due to human impact? And I would say, in the majority of cases, yes, they are. Um, what's that? What, what was that? Um, we have issues where channels have been straightened. So, you know, years back when people needed to grow more hay, they would move a channel to the edge of a meadow and then it caused it to unravel. Sometimes these systems are so sensitive that if you overgraze them, they can't heal themselves, so they just keep getting wider and wider. Um, but the, the neat thing is, is, I think we've been able to, for most cases, find a way to, to, to show landowners that they can still graze or they can still hay, but we can maybe raise the, the, um, the elevation of the water in the channel and narrow things up, and they're gonna get more productivity. We actually did a project on Jim Stone's ranch, he's the chairman of the, of the challenge, and um, his his channel was 10 feet deep and just one long straight thing. We actually restored it out in his meadow, and he went from two and a half tons of hay to over over four tons of hay by doing the work. So again, it's trying to find that win-win of having both. Five. Hi. Yeah. I just uh, will, will attest to the success. I live on Bear Creek yes. and uh, it was completely pushed off to the side of the mountain for grazing and it was restored and it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it's really working and uh, they've done a great job. So I, I can attest to one success anyway. That's great. Yes? Yeah, I was, I was wondering, you had the one example about the, the shallow, tributary and uh, which wasn't good for restoring the, the fish run. Yeah. Um, how, do, how do you make um, decisions, how do you make priorities in terms of what you're going for? Because uh, I can imagine, for example, in that situation, there are certain, certain little creatures that thrive in that kind of natural environment. You bet. How, how do you sort through those kinds of, how do you make priorities? So the question was, how do we make priorities when we are looking at restoring a stream? And the question that that overwinding spring creek. So you're right. There's maybe some amphibians or other or other species that are going to do well in that shallow environment. But what we do is, like on that example, um, we base our, the width of the new stream channel on our, what's called a reference reach. So it's a it's a section of um, upstream in that same area or just downstream that's functioning well, that has clean sediment, has stable banks, all these different variables. So we take those dimensions and then we extrapolate them to this reach we want to restore. But you can't just all be about trout, right? So um, you think about that, that was like a 50 foot wide stream that went down to maybe 10 feet. And then we don't fill in the areas on the other side. Those are left open and we have little, little connecting areas where um, there's water that comes from the actual channel to these back bays, and so you still have your amphibian habitat. Um, a lot of the, the, there's bugs that maybe don't do as well, but they are more tolerant of high sediment loads that aren't natural. So when you, um, 
get your sediment levels in the, on your stream gravels back to what they should be. Then you have like your mayflies and your caddisflies and your stoneflies come back. And those are a really good indicator of water quality as well. So it's a balance and we're trying to, not that we're not trying to play God, but we're trying to, to take our cue from Mother Nature where it is functioning well and, and bring that as part of the design, if that makes sense. Okay. You had a slide that showed the number of Bangalore days and mentioned it was approaching 40,000. How is that trending? Up, down, constant? It's trending up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen, um, they do it I think every other year, but yeah, um, a lot of people love to fish the black whip. Any other questions? Great. Thank you guys so much. I have my own personal experience with uh, BBCQ. Uh, I'm a New Englander originally, and uh, back in Connecticut, I started uh, the Farmington Valley chapter of Trout Unlimited, and uh, was proud of the fact that it, it, it grew to be the second largest TU chapter. In New England, we had 450 members. Uh, we uh, had monthly meetings. We had fundraisers, and at the end of the year, we'd make about 10,000 bucks. And we didn't want it to do with it, but we have it. So I, then I come out here, and I feel a little swaggery because of that. I, I joined the big Blackfoot chapter of TU, and I go to my first board meeting uh, up at Bluebird Forest in Greeno, and I go in there and there's. 11 guys sitting around the table, and three or four guys from different agencies like the Forestry Service and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and, and uh, BLM. And uh, they start talking. I'm, I'm waiting for my turn to kind of give my own pitch. And the first thing they do is they go through the financial records and say, okay, well, we got $750,000 in the bank and CDs. And it's like, oops. <laughs> And uh, let's see, and in our, in our project pipeline, we've got uh, the guy from BLM says, well, I got two and a half million dollars that we're going to grant you for restoring these creeks over here. And then Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, well, we have $850,000 ready to come to you for a two year project. We do this, we do that. And I realized I better just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> it was an amazing difference. Uh, the work they did, the, 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 they weren't. They were, they were aware, they were making science. They weren't executing known techniques. They were, and still do, they develop techniques that aren't known, aren't tested, and they test them and they develop them and they improve them. Those, those various uh, uh, diversion uh, machines you saw with paddle wheels and some solar power, a lot of those are conceptualized and, and tested out here and become standards elsewhere. Very impressive group. Uh, okay. At the risk of repeating myself, uh, we're now going to hear from Stephanie Ambrose Tubbs. Uh, the introduction I gave before still holds. Uh, so, uh, in the just to save time, uh, Stephanie, it's all yours. also like to say a word in praise of the big Blackfoot TCU chapter. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> and that is, I was at the landowners tour one year when they were celebrating some of their major accomplishments and I remember Jim Stone saying, okay, now it's time for a group hug. And the people were like, That's where we draw the line. <laughs> so I, I am going to give paper that is newly written. Yeah, Jack, can you give me a hand over here? <laughs> I'm dying to have him do my microphone. <laughs> Jack and I are old friends from the trail, and he actually does have a friendship medal with him if you're interested in seeing that. Hear me? Good afternoon, or should I say good evening? 
this point. And welcome to the Presbyterian Church. I'm honored to be with you today, and I would like to thank our firefighters and first responders who are working so hard to put this awful season behind us. Thanks to the Alpine artists and to Jenny Royer for the invitation to participate today. This summer I hiked up Man Gulch to several crosses which marked where the victims of the Man Gulch fire fell. The terrain was steep, it was stiflingly hot, and already so dry that the fire warnings had been issued. Needless to say, it gave me a whole new appreciation for the story Norman McLean tells in Young Men in Fire. I feel a special connection to McLean because my father-in-law knew the McLean family and because my brother is someone who could legitimately claim fly fishing is his religion. Mainly I feel connected to Norman because of his passion for rivers, particularly the big Blackfoot River. It has been my good fortune to know several of the cantankerous characters that played a part in the history of the Blackfoot Valley. Some I know personally, and others I know because of their stories. Folks with names like Hobnail Tom, Lan Lindbergh, Jim Stone, Trixie, Big Nelson, Little Nelson, Scotty Brown, Woody the River Guard, and Ovando Hoyt, and the name Kleinschmidt rings a bell. Many of these names are familiar because they stayed on the map. This afternoon, I would like to talk about a name that all but disappeared from the map, but that signifies something important and intangible, something that speaks to the fact that the best heroes are the ones who are human, the ones who have a heart. And so I titled this, What's in a Name? Meriwether Lewis and the Blackfoot River Valley. The Prairie of the Knobs, or Knob Plains, also known as Blackfoot or Stevens Prairie, located near Ovando in Powell County, Montana, near the Blackfoot River, was named by Meriwether Lewis. After dividing the party and heading west so he could explore the Marias River, Lewis wrote, these plains I call the Knob Plains, or the Prairie of the Knobs, from the number of knobs being irregularly scattered through it. In addition, he observed, up this valley and creek, a road passes to Dearborn's River and thence to the Missouri. The road followed a river called the River to the Road to the Buffalo, used by most of the tribes on the western side of the Continental Divide. The young Nez Perce man guiding Lewis at this point told him he could now go ahead on his own. Previously, the expedition, if the expedition had been looking for the shortest possible route to the Pacific, without the added chore of having to locate the source of the Missouri and securing horses, this would have been an excellent shortcut. A little bit more on the Kukalarishkit River, which I'm probably mispronouncing, or the river to the road to the Buffalo, the Blackfoot River, the Buffalo Road River. It is a Nez Perce name for a tributary of the Clark Fork River in Missoula, Missoula County, Montana. According to Roberta Cheney's names on the face of Montana, Quote, before the white man came, there was a trail along the Blackfoot where the road now runs, which was used for the annual buffalo hunt. It was called the Kukalorishkit, or the river of the road to the buffalo. The Nez Perce, Shoshone, flatheads headed east on it each year, hoping to avoid their Blackfoot en enemies. White men recorded the river as the big Blackfoot fork on an 1865 map. Excuse me. After separating from Clark, his quote, worthy friend and companion, to explore the Marias River in July of 1806, Lewis headed up for the confluence of the Blackfoot and Clark Fork Rivers, and then proceeded up the Blackfoot to a gap, now misnamed Lewis and Clark Pass, because Clark never saw it, and then onto the Dearborn River, the Great Falls, and finally to the Marias River. According to the Nez Perce Indians who guided him to the Kukulurishkit, Quote, the river was a very well beaten track. We could not now miss our way. And as they were afraid of meeting with their enemies, the Minotauris, they could not think of continuing with us any longer, end quote. Lewis made sure his guides were supplied with meat. I directed the hunters to turn out early in the morning and endeavor to kill some of meat, more meat for these people, whom I was unwilling to leave without giving them a good supply of provision after their having been so obliging as to conduct us through those tremendous mountains, which he spells tremendous. <laughs> While wintering at Fort Clatsop, the captains determined on their way home the Corps would split up 
so Clark could explore the Yellowstone River and Lewis could investigate the Marias River. The Marias, a river named by Lewis for his cousin, Maria, Maria Wood, quote, the hue of the water of this turbulent and troubled stream, but illy comport with the pure and celestial virtues and amiable qualifications of that lovely fair one. He also noted, it was a noble river, one destined to become, in my opinion, an object of contention between the two great powers of America and Great Britain with respect to the adjustment of the northwesterly boundary of the former. And it will become one of the most interesting branches of the Missouri in a commercial point of view. It was a risky decision to divide the Corps, but one which Thomas Jefferson likely would have approved so long as they did not risk their own lives and the accounts of the explorations contained in the journals thus far. Why split the Corps in this most dangerous region? As Lewis and Clark scholar Joe Musselman writes, quote, the overriding outcome of the expedition had been the discovery that 300 years worth of speculation and exploration had come down to one simple reality. There never was a riverine Northwest Passage across the continent after all. The intricate and dangerous plan the two captains had cooked up between them was their concerted effort to achieve such solitary results salutary results from their journey that the American people would forget the old fantasy of the Northwest Passage. Therefore, on July 3rd, 1806, at Traveler's Rest, the Corps divided with Lewis taking nine men, 17 horses, and indubitably one large black dog, whom we now know was named Seaman, also known as Scannon, a Newfoundland dog. He accompanied the Corps of the Discovery to the Pacific and was believed by some to have returned with his owner, Meriwether Lewis, to St. Louis. Most likely, Lewis purchased him before he left Washington, D.C. for Pittsburgh in 1803. According to his Ohio journal, Lewis paid a substantial amount, or half a month's wages, for the dog whom he, quote, prized much for his docility and qualifications generally for my journey. He rejected a Shawnee Indian's offer of three beaver skins for his pet, writing, of course there was no bargain. I had given $20 for the dog myself. Indeed, Seaman's qualifications generally would prove most valuable to the expedition. Intelligent, loyal, and strong, contemporary Newfoundlands are black in color, although 19th century Newfoundlands were sometimes mixed in color. They weigh up to 150 pounds and stand 30 inches in their prime. A Newfoundland's coat is thick and water resistant. They are accomplished swimmers. Their long tails function as rudders, while their webbed feet and massive chests power them through the water. Also known as sea dogs, Newfoundland's rescued men fallen overboard and hauled lines and nets for fishermen. Descriptions of Newfoundland's standard state, quote, a good specimen of this breed has dignity and proud head carriage. Some speculate that the breed originated in Europe because today's Newf so closely resembles the Great Pyrenees breed. The Newfoundland was indigenous to North America and often lived with Indian tribes along the coast and on the central plains. Ben Franklin and Samuel Adams both owned Newfoundlands. Typical of his breed, Seaman sought above all to protect and please his master. On the Ohio River in September of 1803, he and Lewis witnessed a gray squirrel migration swimming en masse across the river. I made my dog take as many each day as I had occasion for. They were fat, and I thought them when fried a pleasant food. Many of these squirrels were black. They swim very light on the water and make pretty good speed. My dog was of the Newfoundland breed, very active and docile. He would take the squirrel in the water when swimming and bring them to me by his mouth to the boat. Seaman's skill as a hunter also impressed Sergeant Ordway many times. Ordway's journal note noted Seaman retrieving geese, deer, and on April 25th, 1805, he witnessed the dog catching, killing, and bringing in a pregnant pronghorn as it swam across the river. More than once, Seaman protected the expedition at risk of his own life. On May 29, 1805, he saved the crew when a buffalo charged into camp. Quote, 
and was within 18 inches of the heads of some of the men who lay sleeping before the sentinels could alarm him or make him change his course. Still more alarmed, he now took direction immediately towards our lodge, passing between four fires and with a few inches of the heads of one range of men as they yet lay sleeping. When he came near the tent, my dog saved us by causing him to change his course a second time, which he did by turning a little to the right and was quickly out of sight. Many times he protected the party from fierce grizzlies. On June 28, 1805, Lewis observed that, quote, they come close around our camp every night, but, we have never yet but they have never yet ventured to attack us, as our dog gives us timely notice of their visits. He keeps constantly patrolling all night. Seaman endured every trial or chapter of accidents that the men did, except perhaps homesickness. Commenting on the terrible barbed seed that penetrated their moccasins and leggings, Lewis noted, my poor dog suffers with them excessively. He is constantly biting and scratching himself as if in a rack of pain. The dog played his role in what one historian has called the traveling Lewis and Clark medicine show. Lewis did not hesitate to use him at a critical juncture in building up good feelings with the Shoshone. On August 17, 1805, Lewis reported the na natives equally admired, quote, the appearance of the men, their arms, their canoes, our manner of working them, the black man York, and the sagacity of my dog. Sagacity, in this case, meaning quick of sight or thought. The dog's inevitable afflictions caused some genuine concern for Lewis. On a trip to the Spirit Mound in August of 1804, which is uh, somewhere down by Nebraska, Seaman's suffering proved bad enough that Clark noted, at two miles further, our dog was so heated and fatigued we was obliged to send him back to the creek. Later, Seaman endured a bite on the hind leg from a defensive beaver. Ordray reported on May 19, 1805, Seaman, Captain Lewis's dog, got bit by a beaver. A concerned Lewis noted, it was with great difficulty that I could stop the blood. I fear it will yet prove fatal to him. With regard to fleas, it is safe to assume no one suffered as much as Seaman during the dreary winter at Fort Clatsop. On April 24th, 1805, Seaman did what most male dogs do from time to time and disappeared. According to Lewis, my dog has been absent during the last night and I was fearful that we had lost him altogether. However, much to my satisfaction, he joined us at 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> That spring, the Corps encountered immense herds of buffalo along the Missouri River. Lewis mentioned Seaman, quote, walking along the shore this evening, I met with a buffalo calf, which attached itself to me and continued to follow close at my heels until I embarked and left it. It appeared alarmed at my dog, which was probably the cause of its attaching itself to me. Sometime during the journey, Seaman became our dog as described in the journals of Clark, Ordway, and Gass. He is mentioned some 44 times in the journals altogether. For readers of the journals, the idea of having a dog along made the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition take on qualities of an extended family camping trip, which it most certainly was not. <laughs> Worthy to remember that the expedition was a military one, paid for, at least partially, by Congress, and each member from the captains on down had an important role to play. In that sense, Seaman was no different. He was expected to earn his keep, and as the above incidents certify, he did indeed earn his kibble. My father would often say that the question he was most asked concerning Lewis and Clark was, what happened to the dog? There is an answer, some call it apocryphal. It concerns an entry in a book by Tom, Timothy Alden, a collection of epitaphs and inscriptions, published in 1814. He found a dog collar in a museum in Alexandria, Virginia. The collar read, the greatest traveler of my species. My name is Seaman, the dog of Captain Meriwether Lewis, whom I accompanied to the Pacific Ocean through the interior of the continent of North America. Alden included a note describing the dog's reaction to the sad end of Meriwether Lewis. Apparently, he would not leave Lewis's gravesite and died there of dehydration and malnourishment. 
a historian I know, James Holmberg, asserts that the timing of this evidence within five years of Lewis's death provides a credible indication of Seaman's fate. Holmberg has viewed letters indicating that Clark presented the collar to the Mason's Lodge of Alexandria, Washington and their museum in 1812. No trace of this collar remains extant. It is certain that Lewis and Seaman shared a strong emotional attachment. When Seaman was nearly stolen by the Waqalar Indians on the lower Columbia River, it so enraged Lewis, he dispatched three men in pursuit with orders to fire upon the thieves if there was any resistance or hesitation in returning his dog. The last mention of Seaman comes in Lewis's entry for July 15, 1806. Quote, the mosquitoes continue to infest us in such a manner that we can barely exist. My dog even howls with the tortures he experiences from them. They are almost insupportable. They are so numerous that we frequently get them in our throats as we breathe. Readers did not learn of the name of Lewis's dog until the publication of Sergeant Ordway's journal in, in 1916. The editor of the journal just transcribed it in three ways, Scannon, Seaman, S-E-M-O-N, and Scammon. Earlier editions of the journal did not mention the dog. Lewis and Clark scholar Donald Jackson corrected the mistake in 1985 when researching place names along the trail. According to his wife, Kathy, Jackson reasoned that because Lewis and Clark named so many geographical features after members of the Corps, it seemed logical to assume they would eventually get around to naming one for the dog. <laughs> Expecting to find Seaman's Creek was actually Scannon's Creek, Jackson writes that he was mildly startled when he found upon close expect inspection of handwriting samples, the stream was named Seaman's Creek because the dog's name was Seaman. Thanks to Jackson's diligent, diligence, we now know Seaman's Creek was named in honor of Lewis's beloved dog. The compelling story Part of the story of Meriwether Lewis and his dog is the way Lewis's love for his dog proves that Lewis had a heart, that he was more than a walking encyclopedia of natural science and military protocol. History might have made him a hero, but his dog made him a human being, capable of compassion, empathy, and yes, even love. The fact that Lewis cared enough to name this little stream in honor of his dog speaks or barks volumes. <laughs> Lewis, I, and this, I have just learned this, so I kind of stuck it in here. Lewis and Clark named features for each of the core members. Fifteen names were used twice. Lewis had three features named for him, and Clark had four features named for him. You had to do something really special to have a stream named after you, or as in the case of the Marias and the Judith, be fondly recalled by one of the captains. I like to think that on that hot July day in 1806, Seaman did what all large black dogs do in a stream to this day. They splash and swim and run and shake and lie down in the coolness of the water with pure unleashed joy. And I believe that that is why Lewis picked that spot to honor his connection to his four-legged friend. It is also why I believe the name Seaman's Creek should be restored. Seaman matters because his story, celebrated in more than a dozen novels and in one 600-page poem, captures people. It gets them interested in the trail. And for younger audiences, it gets them enthused about getting out on the trail. As such, Seaman is a Pied Piper of the big outdoors, and we all know we need more of those. I have encountered many statues of Seaman across the country, and if reachable, his nose is always polished from the thousands of fans patting him and saying, good dog. My favorite is a larger-than-life rendering of him constructed of 1,400 pounds of steel in Washburn, North Dakota, at the replica of Fort Mandan. He has that look that children of all ages recognize and adore, the look that says, sure, I'll be your friend. Despite varying accounts of his character, I hold no grudge against George Montour, the Hudson Bay scout and interpreter whose name now graces Seaman's Creek. 
Never mind that he has a hill, a mountain, a fire tower, a pass, a waterfall, fall, a road, a monument, and a fishing access, all in his name. While some may have called him an enigma, others saw him as an 1887 version of Paul Revere. One of his more famous acquaintances recently had an Oscar-winning film made about him called The Revenant. Fittingly, Seaman does have a marker along the, along the creek. You can find it off Highway 200 at the Montour Fishing Access. I encourage you to visit and to take a moment to appreciate the love and never-ending loyalty of a dog for his master and the love and never-ending loyalty of a master for his best friend. <laughs> Thank you. Questions. I, you know, I don't have every answer about Lewis and Clark, but I'm sure it's somewhere in this audience we could attempt an answer. Thanks, Jack. Good luck. I have to take it. <laughs> See ya. Um, I would just say that someone commented about on the earlier present presentation about the movie um, being filmed in a different river valley than where it was set. And I understand why they did that, I think. Um, I try to, when I see the movie, not think about that. But and when it comes down to things like this story about Lewis and Clark and Montana, I really believe they should film the story of Undaunted Courage or Lewis and Clark in Montana or somewhere along the trail. I just don't think it's right to take the story up to Canada and film it up there. Um, and I have many people that agree with me on that. There are some who are willing to argue the point. But there still is supposedly a miniseries in the works. And it's been backwards, forwards, sideways. But I'm still hopeful that it will get made and that hopefully they will film parts of it in Montana. Sure. Just seems right. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Jenny Rohr, and I'm real excited to hear our next and final speaker. Um, Juanita Barrow is part of the family that is um, the EBRL, and the EBRL is a hidden uh, guest ranch that many of us don't know that much about, and she's going to share a few things with us about it. Um, they don't advertise, uh, well, well, I might be speaking out of turn, but because people keep coming back and back and back over the years, and Juanita's going to fill us in on that history. Juanita Barrow. Thanks. We're going to get through this really quick because I know I'm between you and your beer and it's already after four. So, um, and this is going to be super casual and it feels awkward being behind a, a podium here. Um, but so I'm, uh, this is uh, a little history about my family's dude ranch, and uh, in the audience here is my, my dad and my godfather, both of whom are wranglers on the ranch, so my, my godfather was a wrangler there in, in what, 1955? A long time ago. Yeah, and, and then my, my dad followed 10 years later in 1965, so it has been around for a while. Um, and it is a, a dude ranch, and so I got kind of hung up on the word dude, Maybe we would talk about that for a little bit. Um, and uh, some could say it's a derogatory term, but I've also heard that dude comes from a Scottish word um, for clothing, as in your duddies is clothing. And so by the late 1800s, apparently um, it, it became dude as to, to represent someone who was a, an urban dandy. Um, and so thinking about the, the yeah, late 1800s, you got Teddy Roosevelt and, and he's come west and you have the opening of the national parks and now you have railroads and there's this kind of nostalgic feel for the American West and cowboys but it's now like safe enough for dudes <laughs> to come out and be comfortable. Um, and then uh, around, yeah, after the war, after World War I, the, com the, the country's prosperous enough now that and the people feel the urge to get out west, and there's automobiles, and there's western movies, and so uh, dude ranches started springing up. And my great-grandparents uh, were part of that. My great-grandfather, Orrin Potter, 
was actually an engineer on the Burlington Northern, or I'm sorry, the Pacific Northern Railroad. And he was coming from uh, Chicago, St. Louis, um, sorry, Chicago, um, and heading west to Seattle when he kind of stumbled upon Missoula, Montana, and fell in love with this area. Continued on to Seattle, where he met my great grandmother, Gertrude, and this was in like the, the turn of the century, and he fell in love with her, um, and, and she with him, but they, they argued constantly. Um, but he did say, he proposed to her, that, do you want to live in Mesopotamia or Montana? Because at that time, there's a lot of building going on uh, from Baghdad to connect um, Syria and, and Turkey. And so, and he was this engineer that could go anywhere. So she chose Montana, so they returned to Montana. And 1906 purchased the land at the confluence of the Clearwater and Blackfoot Rivers. It was in heritage and hospitality and hearts and honesty. And my, my grandfather, my great grandfather, while he agrees with all of those things, he he's, wasn't one for government and, and following the rules. And so he declined the offer to be part of the, the Dude Ranchers Association. So he just continued on his own. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting lost here. So then uh, the ranch, I guess, um, started, well, we had the, um, the depression and lost a lot of our um, employees to the war. And so lots of women and young men who were previous guests really kind of stepped up. And, that, and Jenny was kind of talking about how we don't do any advertising. And it's because we've had these generations of families return to us. And, and you're kind of like, what, are you, what do you really do out there on a dude ranch? And it's like city slickers meets dirty dancing with some Downton Abbey. I mean, really, we've been <laughs> doing the, the same thing for 92 years. Uh, you get up, you eat breakfast, you ride, you come back, you eat lunch, you shoot, you float down the Blackfoot River, you drink, you eat dinner, you play softball, you hang around the campfire and drink some more. And we've been doing that exact same thing like Groundhog Day for 92 years. And, and it's... It's magical. Uh, we didn't really set out to, to do it, but um, we didn't write a business plan or anything, but it is just kind of how our family has evolved. And now I'm just kind of rambling because I really don't know um, what you guys want to know about the Ibarl Ranch. It is this tiny, tiny little ranch. We only take 45 people. Um, we have 20 employees. We're only open June through September. We don't do any advertising. We don't have a sign. We don't have a website. I don't, I grew up not telling people where I lived. Like people ask where you're from. And my father would always say, Missoula. And so that's what we said, Missoula. He's like, it's Missoula County. You're right, I'm not lying. So it's been a very private um, place. But at the same time, um, it's been, uh, we've been so lucky to be part of the community and the Blackfoot Challenge and Trout Unlimited have been huge in, in helping us with our management practices and it's pretty <coughs> exciting that, uh, you know, Jimmy Stone and Lim Limburg, founding TU members, Jim Maser here and my father, um, it, we're all right there and that, that's, that's pretty special. Um, I need to. I, I need some feedback from you guys because otherwise I'm just going to kind of ramble. Yeah. Do you have, Carolyn. Do you have some good stories about? Uh, you know, you've had some remarkable guests over the years. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to use names, but I mean, it must. You have people from all around the world coming. Uh, and what do they value about coming out there? Like I think, like anyone coming to a, a dude ranch, was, and same thing. Teddy Roosevelt wanted. It's like you know, he's a sickly bookish sort of. New Yorker, um, and we have a lot of those. But, uh, and the beautiful thing is, the beautiful thing is, is that um, they come out to the ranch when they're about 13, 14 years old, and maybe they get into a little beer, um, or they fall in love with, a, you know, a Wrangler or a, you know, cabin crew or what have you. And it's about that age they're also discovering the West. They're in the river on their own. And they're in the mountains on a horse by themselves. Like they're not in a ring. They're not with their parents. I mean, their parents are around, but they're not really around. And and so it's a time where these kind of cooped up urban kids can discover the West. And then what I really love is that they hang on to that 
and we see, I'm old enough now, that I can see that 10, 15 years later, they come back either to work on the ranch or they come back to dedicate themselves to the work in the West or conservation in the West. Um, okay, a classic example. We had uh, this guy from Virginia. Um, well, maybe I'll even back up a little further. I'll start with Mum McNulty. So he's this uh, very stern, like what I knew him, like he had this shock of white hair and very frowny, very angry man. He's from Chicago. His family made their money in plaster, like at the World's Fair. So like I, and he had this special recipe for cement. And so I thought that you just stay away from Mum McNulty because you'll end up in cement. But he's a very like, angry man, but he, uh, I thought he was angry, but he's just stern and he loved to fish and he loved the Blackfoot so much. And uh, right in the, in the 80s, the Blackfoot was suffering because there's that, uh, you know, the Mike Horse Dam had failed in the early 70s, so 100,000 tons of toxic sludge had washed down the Blackfoot, killed the fishery. And uh, it's now it's no longer the fishery that he knew and loved. And people, we, the, Montana, you know, didn't have the money to do research, uh, to figure out, like, how do you do this, re uh, uh, the rehabilitation that needs to be done. Fish, Wild and Parks didn't even have money for a baseline study. So Mon McNulty was like, well, how much money do you need? And it was just $15,000, and he wrote a check for $15,000 and kind of kick-started um, Big Blackfoot Chapter of Trout Unlimited, also some uh, fisheries biologists' careers with, with that. Um, and, uh, and that was a guest on the ranch who just loved coming to the ranch and coming to the Blackfoot. Um, Another example would be like in the, in the 90s, um, we had the guy from Virginia who was, drove me nuts. He'd show up every morning or every afternoon to go fishing um, or uh, to go inner tubing and he'd take spinning gear, like full on, like, like all this junk hanging around. I had never seen it. It's a black foot. It's just like, you're only supposed to fly fish, you know, but this guy is like all these hooks and glitter and whatever hanging off this stuff and he'd sit in his inner tube as we're floating down and he'd be like yanking stuff back and forth and I would thought someone's going to like, you know, lose their face. But uh, he ended up hooking a fish that drug him up the stream, down the stream, back and forth, across the stream. Like he's just hanging on in his inner tube. And it was, um, I, I didn't know what it was and finally he like dragged it out of the water and lays it across his lap like a baby. And I, I, I didn't even know if it was a fish because it had this like huge mouth and like three spots and like it looked nothing like the little like cornbread like rainbow trout that I eat for breakfast. Like this didn't, I wasn't even sure if it was a fish, seriously. Um, and it ended up being a bull trout. I'd never seen one. I don't fish. I live like 400 yards from the Blackfoot, but um, it's embarrassing. But uh, he, uh, he found out later that it was a bull trout and then uh, un understood that it was, you know, educated himself and found out that you need to have Ryan Seas, clean, cold, complex, connected water, and that that fish was an indicator of that. And then this is the time when the mines are going in, or the proposed cyanide heat bleach mines going in in the headwaters in Lincoln. And he uh, helps Clark Fork Coalition um, from Virginia and helps them stop the mine, not just them, but the conservation orgs in the area stop that proposal. Um, he finds out that, um, you know, there's bad investments made and that there's not money uh, with 7 up Pete and like you guys all know the sordid history. But he was, you know, in, like an integral part of that. And again, just because of that moment and then his time here on the ranch um, and his access, I guess, to the river. Oh, and if you're talking about like people that people know, like oh, Larry Page or from you know Google or Elon Musk um, or Prince William, but the, all those three people are like names that people hear, but it's not those aren't our. I mean, Larry Page is allergic to horses, and Elon Musk has better things to do, and we have only seen William since you know once when he was ten. Um, <laughs> so, so those aren't our typical clients. Um, <laughs> Um, yes? The thing, Juanita, that occurs to me when I think of the e -L <coughs> is that it's a sort of mystery place. You go there because you're famous somewhere and you want to get away from all that, and um, like Prince William, uh, they send him there because nobody's going to get near him and he'll be safe and all the rest of it. 
and all those Thatcherites who come from the cabinet, <laughs> those guys. What is it that you feel about all these people who want security in, in invisibility, basically? Yeah, and it is secure in the sense we have no locks on anything. There's no safes, there's no padlocks. I, I, my home is hand-forged, you know, door latches, and I'm the only person on the ranch who doesn't own half a dozen firearms. But um, <laughs> it, it's a safe place because um, it doesn't matter who you are, or where, or what you do, or what your title is. I mean, George Osborne was there with his family. Right. Um, but it, it, it just that doesn't matter. What matters on the ranch, it goes back to what the, you know, the dude ranchers, those, those six H's, it, it's, you know, the heart and the hospitality. I mean, that's, that's really, and I think a lot of guest ranches probably have that. It's, it's like when you go on a camping experience, it doesn't really matter who you are. When you're on a camping experience or you're doing that like, like outdoor experiential ed sort of thing, it um, doesn't matter who you are, what your title is, it's, it's how, what your character is. Um, and you can kind of learn what your character is when you're saddle sore or scared um, or hungover or you know, exhausted and dehydrated. And so, but, but to your point, Michael, I, what makes a ranch special is that the, I think the family and the people that have been there, like Jim Maser here, he, he was, you know, 17 when he started, and, and I mean, he's my godfather. And, and, and it's just been the kind of same people, uh, we're all a little crazy, but um, it's the, the same people have been there since the beginning. And it's not just blood family, it's a collection family. Like we have, you know, staff members who started up washing dishes in the 90s and now he's our ranch manager and we, we could not function without him. Anik. Well, just recently you've opened yourselves up to a literary conference. Ah. Out. Is that, as far as I know, that's the only time you've had conferences. I'm not sure, maybe you have, have others. But what, what kind of a change is that? Is that a change of direction? You're opening up the place to a, to a different kind of clientele. What, what, what's behind deciding to And that was really fun. So having, having that conversation with Chris Dombrowski, she's talking about the Beargrass Writers Retreat, <coughs> which is just awesome. It was just our third year doing it this year with them. And uh, when we started with Chris, we were like, oh, we, you know, he's trying to advertise this thing because so he needs people there. But like, you can't tell them where it's at. <laughs> you know? And it's like you, I was like, well, yeah, Chris, you can use the photos, but don't tell anyone, don't say e -bar L Ranch, you know. Um, but uh, what, what's changed, I guess, with that was that they weren't coming, there's kind of like a dead period. It's the very end of August when, we, when all the, our, our families have gone back to school. And, and they don't ride very much. They're there to workshop and to write um, and, so, and to hang out with writers. And so they're pretty, uh, we don't really have to take care of them that much. We just need to make sure that they're comfortable and there's plenty of whiskey. And, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> So I think, but you're right, and there's also, uh, there's a foundation group for the University of Montana, the Grizzly Riders, that have been coming for 25 years. And that, that brings some different folks. Um, but again, that's not the typical ranch experience. And so we do open it up to groups, but it has to be kind of in our off season in September. And, and, and they're a little different, because those are folks that come through for a couple days and, and um, I, I think they probably have a little different experience, but they're there for a different reason. Um, but it's fun. That it's it is it's kind of fun to to have that that different energy. Yes. Do you or have you ever run cattle on the ranch? Well, because we have just over a hundred head of horses, we need all the grass we can get for our horses. Um, we did. Well, Jim. How, I didn't even think it was that much, but okay. So, but it's just not the, quite the right landscape to run a lot of cattle on. We don't have the right grass to, it's not like Florida. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a little drier, and, um, and like I said, we need all the hay that we can put up and all our rangeland pasture that we have um, for, for our horses. And plus, Cattle, then, then you're, then you're into the cattle business, and we're just in the people business. My great grandparents, like, they didn't even, they didn't start out as a um, cattle ranch. They started out 
stumbled into a dude ranch because my great grandfather came back from the war and he wanted you know his buddies to come out and visit him from MIT and from um, from wherever he was traveling in Europe and uh, they would come out and once you get out to back in those days once you get out to the ranch you have to stay there for the month and my great grandmother got sick of taking care of them and so she was like your buddies are gonna pay for the food and staff and we're gonna rent some horses and and it very organically became a dude ranch um, but that was kind of like a thing that was happening in the mid-20s and so it all kind of made made sense to them at the time okay it's 425 yeah. thank you guys we'll see you tonight at Jerry's yeah. if you think Juanita is a good storyteller then you should join us Sunday night at the Wilma for tell us something where she is going to be one of the eight storytellers oh, okay. Thank you, everybody, and come back tomorrow morning. Our program starts at 9 o'clock. <laughs>